Friday. So he's done with Friday. He's going to step up. And so he's going to repair. That's all I would be like. Somebody's going to all be up on the Washington.
Good morning and welcome. A Lenten Bible study, Luke, Jesus, and the Outsiders, Outcasts, and Outlaws by Adam Hamilton begins Sunday, February 19th at 3 p.m. and also Wednesday, February 22nd at 10.30 a.m. These are the same programs. Uh, you can choose either, either one that you wish. Pastor Ralph will lead this study of Jesus' ministry according to the Gospel of Luke. Please sign up on the bulletin tear-off sheet or contact the church office. Books are $15. The Joy Women's Retreat is scheduled for Saturday, February 25th in the CLC from 9.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. A light lunch of various salads and desserts will be provided. A donation of $15 is requested. Reserve your seat by Friday, February 17th. Sign on the bulletin tear-off sheet and place in the offering plate or call the church office. Also, on February 12th, Sunday, uh, there will be a Valentine's Church Social following the 11 a.m. service. Just bring yourself and your, your favorite side salad or dessert. All are invited. So uh, I guess I should point out that that uh, Outsiders and Outlaws is not directed to one particular family. You're all welcome. Uh, we're all outlaws somewhere or another. Uh, every Wooten I meet claims to be on the black sheep side of the family. I've yet to meet one that was on the reputable side of the family, which tells me a lot, <laughs> a lot about our family. There's a reason we left England uh, to get out of trouble, I reckon. So, good morning. I'm Ralph. I'm Pastor Ralph, and uh, we've got friends joining us on Facebook, and, and uh, you all know me, and uh, they may not, but I'm grateful that you're all here. Grateful that you've come to worship. Uh, I thought about it as I'm looking around, and we have various uh, wheeled uh, aids uh, to help people get around. Uh, I remember at one of my churches, they would line them up in the aisle, and sometimes we'd have three or four. Now, some folks look at that, and it's discouraging. But what it tells me is, you went to great trouble to come to church, and I'm grateful. You know that this is a place of hope, and a place of healing, and a place of help. And you've decided that you're going to come, and I am grateful for that. Thank you all so much for being here to worship together with us. Would you stand as you're able and let's have our call to worship. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gathers the poor of the earth. Glorious is our God who wipes away the tears of sorrow. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gives inheritance to the meek. Glorious is our God who satisfies the hunger of the just. Wonderful is the God of Christ who gives mercy to the merciful. Glorious is our God who gives vision to the pure in heart. Wonderful is the God of Christ who adopts the peacemakers. Glorious is our God who lifts high the persecuted. Wonderful is the God of Christ who finds the lost. Glorious is our God who awakens the dead. Let's pray. Lord and Creator, let us embrace the, the costly blessings which you desire for us, blessings which confound the wisdom and strength of this world. Teach us to be your agents of preservation in a world touched by death and beacons of hope in a world shrouded in darkness. Transform us into the image, into your image through the crucible of the cross, writing your mandates upon our hearts, made pure by your perfect love, embolden us to be your ambassadors, living as representatives of your holy kingdom, stirring in us your love for others, especially for those who would seek to destroy us because of you. Make us decrease so that you might increase as a watching world sees you and not us. 
Daily, Lord, we declare that our priorities are not ours and your priorities are not ours. Even before our own needs and desires, every moment we live, we live for your glory, the glory of a loving Father and a just King. Free us from any distraction, craving or anxiety that would keep us from fully following you. For we acknowledge that everything we could possibly need is yours to give us. Remind us of our sinful brokenness and your gift of grace as we encounter brokenness in others. You are the answer to our every question. You are the treasure we so desperately seek. It is you who invite us into your salvation as prodigals returning to the Father's embrace. Keep us upon your path of righteousness and justice, bearing the good fruit of your spirit. For it is on you, Lord Jesus, that all our hope is built for all of creation now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Would you open your books to page 451 as we sing, Be Thou My Vision, page We confess our faith saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. Thank you so much for your uh, faithfulness in tithing and giving offerings. And I am grateful for the faithfulness of our church. Stanley mentioned some of that uh, uh, last Sunday. Uh, we, are, we are faithful and you are faithful and we are faithful together. And so uh, I am grateful that we can be part of, uh, part of Christ's ministry amongst all the world. And now let us receive our Lord's tithes and offerings this morning. Lord, bless this offering. 
may it be given for the glory of your name and for the good of your people that the gospel may be preached all around the world. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. So I was gone all week to a camp and I missed y'all. I missed a bunch of folks. And uh, one of the things I realized about all of us that were at this camp up in North Alabama is we all missed our pets. So much so that uh, my, my special group that I had, as everybody was going home, they were sending us pictures of their pets. This is a... This is a dog named Levi. I think Levi looks like he's sleeping. Maybe so. Maybe a little, maybe a little Chihuahua, maybe a little Australian Shepherd. I forget what this dog's name is, but the lady sent it along with her brand new grandbaby. <laughs> the, the grandbaby's the skin puppy, right? Doesn't have much fur on it, right? Um, 
Well, there's not a dog in this picture, but that must be your husband. So, um, so when I got home, I sent him a picture of my old man. This is my Duke. He's a sweet old dog. He's 12. Any of y'all 12? He what? I'm heading towards 61 myself. All right, he's 13. Any of y'all 13? Who's closest to 13? Well, um, yeah, he passed that. He's way past that. Right. So I love my puppy. Do y'all have Do y'all have pets? Dogs? You're a cat person. We were cat people. Yeah. Striper, Greystone. Anybody got fish? You got fish? Anybody got turtles? I got. I got a fish. You got fish. All right. So I like fish. They're fun to watch, but you can't really talk to them much. Uh, and the cats don't listen, right? I mean, cats do what they want to do. Yeah. Yeah, they are fluffy. And we used to wake up with our with our cats. Our chins would be wet where our cats had sat on our chest and were breathing, looking into our face. It was a little creepy, but we loved them. You know, uh, one of my friends, his dog, Clover, had a really serious health issue right before he left to come to camp. And his dog's name is Clover. And we prayed for Clover while we were at camp. Because, just like y'all, pets are important. And, and we want our pets to be happy. We want them to be healthy. We take care of them, don't we? You have two pets. You got two fish? Okay. One, okay. Do you feed them? So the grown-ups are like, hey, how's he going to do this? So, uh, can we get the poison? You ready? So when we take care of our pets, we're learning how to take care of creation, which is what God told us to do. We're supposed to take care of where we live and the people who live around us and our pets. And I think God gives us pets because, I don't know, I think Jesus would have been a dog, cat, donkey, goat, whatever person because we need friends and, and animals love you unconditionally. That's the wonderful thing. Let's thank God for his unconditional love that sometimes he shows us through our pets. Lord Jesus, thank you for all of our pets that love us unconditionally. Lord, thank you for making them a physical way that we can know about your love that is unconditional. Lord, help us to love others the same way you have loved us, the same way we love our pets. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing with me. Today, we're going to sing another hymn right now. So if you'd open your books to page uh, 707 and stand and let's sing the hymn of promise.
Charlene. You may be seated this morning. We go to the Lord in prayer. In a few moments of silence, I encourage you to lift before the Lord in your heart those people who you are concerned about, those situations that you are concerned about. Maybe even that old dog that's not getting around quite as well. Let's take a moment and lift them to the Lord. <clears throat> Almighty God, God and Father of us all, God, who Jesus reminded us was like a hen that wanted to gather their chicks up under their wing. God of all creation who loves each one of us. We pray this morning, your church gathered together the ecclesia, the called out ones. We gather here in this place. Others are gathering in California and in Denver, Colorado, and Austin, Texas, and Kentucky, and places in Minnesota and Michigan, and all around our nation, and all around our world. Lord, your people gather in places where they have a beautiful sanctuary like we do. Some gather in a place where there's incense and candles. Some gather in a place where there's hardly anything. Yet, we are your church. Lord, bless your church. Help us to transform the world that we live in. <clears throat> Gaining strength and courage inside these walls and going out to be your hands and feet to show your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayers. Lord, we realize that uh, the world outside of this church is also the world that's inside of us when we walk through the doors. Lord, for the anxieties and the fears and those who perpetuate those fears and anxiety. Lord Jesus, in your mercy, bring healing to them. Bring healing to us. Bring peace into the world. Lord, the shalom peace, the wholeness that you came to provide for all of us, not just the absence of one particular conflict or another, but the peace that passes all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in you, Christ Jesus. We pray for the world that that peace might be something that they experience every day, every moment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, God, for those this morning that are that their lives are so intertwined with ours in so many different ways that you would be with them. They, they who are hurting in body, mind, and spirit. Some wounds visible, some invisible, some so deep they don't even recognize them themselves. Bring healing. Gather your people alongside them to help them heal. To work out their salvation with fear and trembling. We pray God especially for those who sit with our loved ones that they might be your messengers of grace and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We remember this morning in the communion of saints, Charles Fred DuBose, Shirley Luke, and others, Lord, that have died this week and recently. We are grateful that they have joined that great cloud of witnesses 
who together with us make up the family of saints. And we are grateful that the connection we have with them in love and grace and mercy does not end with the last heartbeat. But rather, Lord, it continues on into eternity. We're just loving you and each other in different places. Lord, bless all of your saints. We pray together as they do, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.
Please stand as you're able. Today's reading is from Matthew 5, verse 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thank you, to God. God. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> killed it, Jim. <laughs> Apparently that was the last of the batteries, so, yeah. Sometimes that happens, you just run out of battery. That'd be a great sermon, wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, I think I had run out of battery when I left town Monday morning. And I, I thank God for the opportunity to be away and in Nauvoo, Alabama. Uh, to get to Nauvoo, you go to Jasper. And what did we say in Sunday school? You, you drive out in the middle of nowhere and then you go down into the woods, right? It's not quite that bad, but if you've ever been to Walker County, it's pretty close, pretty close. Beautiful place though, Count McDowell. Let's talk about place. When Janet and I went to the Holy Land, uh, we, were, uh, we were constantly told, this is the place where, right? We had a Palestinian guide and he would say, this is the place that they will tell you is such and such, right? He had enough irony about him and he had enough knowledge to say, there are other places that this could have happened. But So there's this beautiful church uh, on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, up on what you and I would call a rise, not even a mountain, it's a little bit of a hill, right? And this is the place where uh, Helena, uh, mother of Constantine, if she was right, this is where Jesus preached the, the, the Beatitudes, right? Uh, Helena came to the Holy Land and uh, <laughs> she kind of picked out spots where she thought stuff happened and by golly, they built a church there. And so that's where it is. Uh, you'll see that at the Church of the Nativity. Uh, uh, you'll see it uh, in Nazareth, the Church of the Annunciation. You'll see it uh, outside the walls of Jerusalem uh, in the Church of Agony, the Basilica of Agony, where Jesus is supposed to have prayed. But I kind of agree with our Palestinian guide. I think it's across the street, back up in this cave up behind the uh, olive trees, based on the fact that they said it was in a grove. So, But uh, it's a beautiful little church, this church on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful place to sit and kind of think about what it must have looked like when Jesus gathered all of these people around and, and began to teach them. It's interesting to note that this particular area, Galilee, was also known to be a bit of a political hotbed. Um, it, it would have been a troublesome place for the Roman government. 
Let's just put it that way. Uh, it would have been a place where peace and violence, injustice, hunger, that sort of thing would have been done. And so when Jesus is talking to this group of people, he's talking to people who know what it's like literally to be hungry, who know what it's like literally to be beaten, who know what it's like literally to suffer unjustly. One more physical note about the Mount of the Beatitudes. It's uh, 25 meters below sea level, so that makes it one of the lowest summits in the world for a mountain. But there's been a church there for over 1,600 years, and so that's where people go. Jesus gathered his disciples and all the other people came and he began to teach them. Now, in my translation, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I still say it the way I learned it with the King James Bible. Blessed is, blessed are, not blessed are, blessed are. Now, your translation may say, happy are. For me, happy just doesn't quite catch me. Right? I think happy, I think of the little yellow smiley face. Be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Well, first of all, that just doesn't always work, does it? Right? James said, count it all joy. He didn't say be happy about it. Count it all joy. There's some stuff in here that might not make you too happy if you were the one suffering. So part of what happened at camp this week, I felt like a teenager coming back off of a winter retreat. And, you know, you sort of have to give a testimony as to what happened at camp. But, but part of what happened at camp this week is um, I was invited to think about this text in our Bible, in our scriptures, being written not just by one person, cloistered off somewhere in a room by themselves with the Holy Spirit tapping them on the head, but the fact that the Holy Spirit might have used the entire community to write this text. And I can, uh, I can almost see the discussion happening. Somebody says, maybe it's Matthew. So he said, y'all remember when Jesus said, this is how a lot of stories start out in our families, right? Remember when daddy used to say something about that girl with butter in her mouth? That was one of my daddies. She was Becky Richardson Kimini. She had a, a smooth, melodic voice that you just like, oh, that must be what an angel sounds like. Right? And when she sang, you knew that's what an angel sounded like. But a lot of stories start with, you remember when? Or do you remember daddy saying, or do you remember mama used to say? And I can only imagine that the disciples at some point say, well, you know, we probably ought to write down what Jesus said because we're going to, I'm not feeling too good and you look like you're about to die. We really ought to write this down because everybody, everybody needs to know the stories of Jesus. And I can hear somebody say, you remember when Jesus said we're blessed? Of course, they're in the southern part of Israel, so they sound like I do. Well, that's not what he said. Well, what did he say? Well, Jesus said, I, no, I remember, blessed are the ones who will inherit the earth. And somebody said, no, that is, that's not what he said. Somebody else chimes in, well, that's not it. But I remember him saying, uh, I remember them having a whole list of people that were going to be blessed. Blessed are the poor. Jesus said, blessed are the poor. And somebody says, no, 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 not blessed are the poor. We're all poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For theirs is the kingdom. We're going to get ours. And they're like, no, wait, wait. Somebody said, no, no, no. Blessed is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs will be the kingdom of heaven. And still another says, blessed are those who mourn. And someone adds, for they shall be comforted. 
And so on it goes. And Matthew's writing all of this down. Another one says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be blessed with mercy. And on and on it must have gone until finally Matthew is satisfied. And the Holy Spirit says, we probably ought to cut this off right here. And they decide this is it. This, this is what Jesus said. Everybody agrees that this is what Jesus said. And the story of Jesus preaching on the hillside was finished. Now, most scholars will agree that this list of Beatitudes probably wasn't Jesus checking off boxes and telling these folks this one, two, three, four, five. This is probably a collection of things that he taught. I wish I could have the other parts. I wish I could hear the questions that people ask. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could heard the stuff that those kids said because wow, right? I killed my pet. Well, bless Jesus, right? <laughs> hey, you don't ask questions unless you're ready for the answers. That's another, that's another sermon. Um, and so the disciples would meet together and they would break bread, just like Jesus did with them. And they'd tell these stories together and they'd encourage each other. And maybe somebody was going through a hard time and they had a run in with the government. And they're like, man, they're persecuting me. Well, why are they persecuting you? Well, I was giving somebody some food and they told me I had to leave. I couldn't, I was just doing what Jesus said. The disciples would remember, well, blessed are you if you're persecuted for Jesus' name's sake. And so they encouraged one another. And it became a way that their lives were transformed as they shared those stories. Isn't that what we want? Don't, don't we want our lives and the lives of the people around us to be transformed from glory into glory, from grace to grace, from mercy to mercy? Don't we want the world we live in, we live in to be transformed into the likeness of Christ? That's why we get together and we share the stories and we encourage one another. Every so often we break bread together, not only at the table of Holy Communion, but here Sunday Two weeks from now, we're going to break bread around the table and celebrate a different kind of holy communion. God's people gathered together in love and in fellowship. We want to have a way of living that transforms the world through the love of Jesus. And I know we're not there yet. I, I know. You know too, we're not there yet. But one day a change is going to come and we will be there. And we're on the journey. There's a power shift in the Beatitudes. Uh, the power shifts from those that are causing pain and hunger and intimidation and grief and anger to those that are, that are transformed through the love of God. That, this passage is hard in a lot of different ways. It, uh, it goes against our Western society idea of, of uh, uh, commerce-driven winner-take-all, right? Y'all seen, uh, seen that saying? It may even be a bumper sticker. He who dies with the most toys wins. Y'all ever seen that? You're just dead. You <laughs> Your toys go to somebody else, right? And maybe the Maybe the payment book. I don't know if that's how that works or not. It goes against even our idea of justice. Lex colonis. Eye for an eye. Notice that as Jesus talks, he talks about the positive aspects of living like you're in the kingdom of God. He doesn't say what the punishment will I hadn't ever really thought about that until I read that this week. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and the rest of you are going to hell. That would be sort of a commodification of it. That's a word I learned this week, commodification. 
I got to use it. It's like our faith is a commodity. If I do this right thing, then I'm going to get this good thing. And if he does that bad thing, then I'm going to make sure he gets worse. Right? Jesus talks about the blessing for living into his life. He doesn't mention the curses for not living in the covenant relationship. We tend to want there to be some sort of transaction in our faith lives. Like I said, we do good, we get good. Somebody does bad, we want to bury them under the jail, right? Unless it's me, and then I want mercy and grace. Derek Weber said that uh, someone said in all the furor to post the Ten Commandments in courthouses and on city lawns, that perhaps we ought to post in our courts of law the Beatitudes instead. Blessed are the merciful might read differently on the wall of a criminal court, might we? But then we couldn't do that, some would argue. That would simply be impractical. It wouldn't fit in that place. After all, the court is a place of law, not grace. I'd like to think that our courtrooms can also be a place of grace. As well as law. We often speak of the letter of law when we, <laughs> when we want folks to get what we think is coming to them, we talk about the letter of the law, not the, not the spirit of the law. After all, it's them, not us, right? We don't want it, but, but they did it, so let's get them. Some people look at the Bible that way. They take, they take things very, very literally and, and except for the parts that they want to take an exception to. One of the great conservative Baptist preachers, uh, Jerry Vines, used to say that some parts of the Bible are literally figurative. And some of those tent poles were literally just tent poles. Some folks look at the Bible and they think of it as just stories. Notice, just stories. That have a, a few principles that are universal. C.S. Lewis is famous for using uh, the Chinese term the Tao to refer to universal laws and principles that are common throughout all cultures. You can find it in his short book, The Abolition of Man. Great book. Highly recommend reading it. I feel like we have... Um, Entered a world of men without chests. I'll let you read the book. You'll know what I'm talking about. Some folks don't look at the Bible at all. And you know why? They've seen the people who claim they believe the Bible acting in ways that are just absolutely horrendous. And they don't want anything to do with a book that teaches people to act like that. It's funny, some of those people that say they believe the Bible apparently don't read it. If they did, they wouldn't act like that. What if, what if we looked at the Beatitudes and, and focused more on acting on those attitudes? Maybe take a day and decide that we're going to be poor in spirit. And we're going to surrender everything to the Lord. And, and when we start to eat, we're going to say the blessing and we're going to mean it. When we, when we say we're going to pray for somebody, we stop and we really pray for them. I had done pretty good at camp and I hadn't cried one time, even though we'd had a whole lot going on until my friend mentioned his dog, Clover. And I broke down in tears. Clover had a stroke. I don't know about y'all, if you got an old dog, that hurts. What if we really prayed for somebody when we say we would? Maybe, maybe we decide that we're going to comfort somebody who's mourning. Or, or maybe we decide that we're going to let ourselves mourn over that loss that we've tried to ignore. Or maybe we just take a day and we say, you know, I'm going to be merciful. 
I'm not going to yell at that person who cuts me off. By the way, had that happen on the way home yesterday. Apparently, I backed out in front of a lady in the rest stop and she went. <laughs> I can't remember what I did next, but I kept driving. I'm not sure she flipped me off or not, but I think the intent was there. <laughs> Bless her, the peacemaker. Maybe we take a day and instead of showing up at every fight we've been invited to, we decide to take the path of peace. We desperately need more pure and hard peacemaking people in the world we live in. We have enough folks looking to hurt, harass, and harm. We need Jesus people following Jesus and doing what Jesus says. Some people read the Beatitudes and think of it as a, a prescription for the kingdom of God. If we do these things and take our pills, then this will be what the, this will be what ushers in the kingdom of God. Other people look at it and go, "Well, that sounds like this is what the kingdom of God looks like." I think it's sort of both. We act merciful in order to receive mercy, so that we can be merciful, so that we can receive mercy, so that we can be merciful. We comfort those who mourn because we know that we too will be comforting when we mourn. The Apostle Paul said it this way. Praise be the God and Father of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions, all our troubles. So that we can comfort others with the comfort that we have received. If I ever do a funeral with you, you're probably going to hear that. Because it reminds me that in the communion of saints, we all mourn from time to time. And we all need comfort. And that's why we're here. Derek Weber says, Blessed is the community who knows persecution is inevitable and still decides to make room for those the world thinks are unimportant. So take a snapshot of the community of faith. You might be surprised at how blessed you are. You all do these things. Maybe not as consistently as you'd like to, but you do these things. You comfort. You're merciful. Could you be more merciful? Absolutely. Could you be more pure in heart? Absolutely. We all could. I can only imagine that somebody might have sat on the side of the Mount of the Beatitudes with the Sea of Galilee at their back. And at one point when Jesus quit talking and it looked like things were over, somebody said to somebody else, well, now what? Where do we go from here? Somebody said, well, I think Jesus, I think they said something about him getting in a boat and going across. Now, I'm not talking about that. Where do we go from here? Friends, I'm not sure. But I know the way, the truth, and the life. And I know he loves us. And so let's go together. Let's go together and follow him. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I will follow on. Amen.
Would you stand and turn to page 431 and let's sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth, another wonderful song. <laughs> of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always as you go out to serve the Lord in peace. Jesus loves you. I love you. Go in peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.